Hey, fourth graders, Mr. B again, back with more of A Season of Gifts, and here's Miss Lucy to help me. Hopefully she's going to help me this time. Okay, so here we go. Chapter 5, The Afternoon of the Turtle. I walked Ruth Ann home after the first day of school. She looked a little pale, a little droopy, but she'd hung on to her Davy Crockett lunch bucket, which was better than what happened to me. Two big bozos who were repeating sixth grade stole my lunch. They were Newt Fluke and Elmo Leaper Jr., both about 5'10", and Newt shaved. They also happened to be a couple of the big uglies who'd thrown me into Salt Creek. Anyway, I'd save back an apple in my desk the way you do when you're not one of the bigger kids. Ruth Ann took my hand across the street, and I let her. No one was looking. How'd you like first grade, I asked, because she wasn't saying. It was all right. We cut out fall leaves from construction paper, she said, but I thought by afternoon we'd be reading. What are knits? Knits. Ah, I said. Well, they're louse eggs. Or baby louses, lice, something like that. Why? The teacher checked in our hair for them. Oh, did she find any? She found a lot on a girl named Ida Bell Eubanks. My desk has a name. Roscoe? Ruth Ann nodded. Mrs. Dowdell had fired up her cauldron that afternoon. I noticed from my window when I was upstairs messing around in my room, she was boiling shucked sweet corn in batches. She pitchforked the ears in and out. Smoke billowed up around her. I looked again, and there was Ruth Ann on the far, on the far side of the cannas. Mother had captured her long enough to get her out of her school dress and into coveralls. Now Ruth Ann was over by the hollyhocks, already deep into Mrs. Dowdell's territory. She'd pulled off a few blossoms to make up a little family of hollyhock dolls. Without Rachel, Ruth Ann was kind of lost and alone in the world. She used hollyhock buds for heads and upside-down flowers for the skirts. That kind of business. Toothpicks for arms. Ruth Ann was helping herself to the hollyhocks, and Mrs. Dowdell was pitchforking her bubbling corn. The distance was narrowing between them but each one was in a separate world. Busy. Then, pretty soon, Mrs. Dowdell dropped her pitchfork and headed off to her cob house. She practically ran Ruth Ann down, but neither one paid any attention to the other. When Mrs. Dowdell came back, she was lugging a crate with something on top. A big mixing bowl? Who knows? She did all kinds of things in her yard most people do indoors. She planted the bowl on the ground and tipped the crate. Something rolled out. From up here, it looked like a rusty hubcap, but bigger. It was there in the grass. Then it moved by itself. Ruth Ann watched. It was a turtle, a great big thing. It started crawling toward the fire, thought better of that, and made a slow turtle turn. Mrs. Dowdell stood over it, keeping an eye on it taking her time. Ruth Ann was right there in her shadow. There was a stick in Mrs. Dowdell's hand, no longer than a clothespin. She bent to tease the turtle with it, and I guess he fell for it. I couldn't really see from up here, but he stuck his neck out of the shell. Bad idea. A turtle will take your finger off, especially if you bother it, Mrs. Dowdell, bent double, invited the turtle to take a bite out of the stick she was offering between two careful fingers. Ruth Ann tucked her fingers into her armpits. She was all eyes. The turtle must have chomped down on the stick because Ruth Ann jumped. Out of her apron, Mrs. Dowdell drew a business-like knife. It flashed once and the turtle who wouldn't stop biting the stick, couldn't pull his head back in his shell. The head flew. Ruth Ann jumped a foot. With a big shoe, Mrs. Dowdell kicked the turtle head into the fire. 
Now she was squatting in the yard. A turtle can crawl till sunset after it's lost its head. She flipped it over, and it lulled. I couldn't see this part at all, but Mrs. Dowdell had gone to work running the knife around the shell to cut it loose from the skin, sawing in a circle. I could only see this happening in Ruth Ann's face. She was as interested as she'd been in anything in her life. Mrs. Dowdell seemed to work the skin off. Uh, seemed to work the skin off the turtle's feet. She lifted the shell like the lid off a stew pot and set it rolling away toward a garden row. Ruth Ann watched it go. Finally, Mrs. Dowdell heaved herself upright. With a small mess of turtle guts in her cupped hands, she went over to the fire and threw them in. Ruth Ann's mouth hung open. She was all eyes and mouth. Even her braids looked interested. Mrs. Dowdell worked over the rest of the turtle, carving up the parts you can eat to fry for her supper. She didn't bring over any for us, but there's not a lot of eating in one turtle. But the point is, from that day on, the afternoon of the turtle, Ruth Ann was Mrs. Dowdell's shadow, and Mrs. Dowdell let her be. Ever after, Ruth Ann seemed to forget she'd ever lived in Terre Haute or anywhere but here. Phyllis didn't get home till five on that particular afternoon. There'd been high school meetings about upcoming fall events. A sock hop, a hayride, corn husking, homecoming. Somebody gave her a ride home. Somebody. Counting us Barnharts, nine people showed up at Dad's first service that next Sunday. I ushered, wearing a white shirt and a necktie of Dad's. It was longer than my fly. I could have put everybody in one pew, but I scattered them around. Still, Dad could count, and it wasn't much of a turnout. One lady wore a Mackinac jacket and a hat with a veil. Her eyes were all over the place, and her teeth came out to meet you. I ain't a Methodist, she warned me as I steered her out of pew. I'm from the church across the tracks, so I'm washfoot. I'm just here to see how the heathens worship. She grinned quite friendly through her veil, and her teeth were a real assortment. She said she was Mrs. Wilcox. Mother sat up front in her summer dress. Next to her was Ruth Ann with six or eight hollyhock dolls to fill out the pew. Phyllis sat in the back row, writing a letter. I passed the plate. Pollen blew in through the torn windows. Dad said, let us make a joyful noise, and we try to him. Blessed assurance. But we tapered off. Dad cut his sermon short so we'd be out ahead of the United Brethren. The Washfoot congregation across the tracks went on for another hour. Mrs. Wilcox had time to catch it on her way home. After church, we counted out the offering on our kitchen table. A dollar twelve, and two meat ration tokens from World War II, and a small scattering of S and H green stamps. Great oaks from Little Acorns Grow, Dad said. Not too certain. Mother didn't look too certain at all. <clears throat> Mrs. Dowdell hadn't turned up, but it was well known that she wasn't a church woman. Where would she find the, the time? As the fall days got shorter, hers got longer. She'd put up a carload of corn relish. The labels on the bell jars were written out in a hand that looked like Ruth Ann's printing, though she'd had help with the spelling. Corn Relish, 1958 It was getting harder to keep Ruth Ann home. Mother about gave up trying. A jar of corn relish rolled all the way over onto our porch. The tarp I'd once worn was stretched on Mrs. Dowdell's side yard, thick with drying black walnuts. The stove links began to rise in piles on her back porch. She could see winter from here. I couldn't, of course. I couldn't see a day ahead. Typical of me, the next time trouble broke out next door, I was sound asleep. Part 2. The Fall of the Year Chapter 6. The Haunted Melon Patch Evidently, Mrs. Dowdell always had extra trouble in the fall of the year. 
nameless figures were known to sneak down behind the houses to her patch and swipe her melons. It was kind of a local tradition. Dating couples had been flushed out of this same location. The town knew Mrs. Dowdell was armed and dangerous, but high school kids would figure that trying to steal a half-ripe watermelon was worth the risk of getting your head blown off. Even after her long days, Mrs. Dowdell sat guard down there. You could see her on sentry duty from our back porch. She made herself pretty comfortable. There was a nip in the air now, but she'd put together a little stove from cinder blocks and an oven rack. A pot of camp coffee brewed on the grill. She buried baking potatoes under the fire, and there she hunkered on two overturned pails and a cap with flaps and three or four afghans. Her melons and squash were coming on. Behind her on the vines climbing the cob house, her gourds were ready. And so was she. The Winchester was always across her big knees, unless she was cleaning it by firelight. Maybe sitting out in the hazy night, watching the sparks rise to join the stars, gave Mrs. Dowdell ideas. Maybe she even saw weird visions in the firelight's flicker. Who knows? A rumor about that particular melon patch began to drift through town. At first, it wasn't louder than the whisper of dry leaves. A word here, a word there. It could have come from anywhere. Then, it broke into print in the county seat newspaper. A column called, News from Our Outlying Communities, appeared in the Piot County Call. Strange Sightings in Rural Vicinity According to Mrs. Dowdell, a lifelong resident, there is no truth to the story making the rounds of one of our smaller villages. In a melon patch at the rear of the Dowdell property, rumor reports that an unexplained presence has been sighted by various intruders in the dark of night. Young couples have fled the patch in terror, leaving behind half-empty bottles of Thunderbird wine, picnic blankets, and several transistor radios. Horse feathers! Mrs. Dowdell is quoted as saying, or a very similar word, I ain't seen a thing out of the ordinary, and I'm in my patch near very nearly every night to discourage the juvenile delinquents who has taken over the town. However, the elderly landowner admitted that her property and outbuildings are built over an ancient Kickapoo burial ground. Oh, Shaw, Mrs. Dowdell expostulated, as kids, we was forever digging up arrowheads and calabashes and all them ancient relics, beadwork and such stuff. Once in a great while, a skull would surface or a dog would dig up something. And the unexplained presence? Well, some used to say they'd seen the ghost of a girl in a feathered headdress and moccasins, Mrs. Dowdell recalled. You know how people talk. They called her the Kickapoo Princess. When our reporter inquired if she'd ever seen the ghostly Kickapoo princess herself, the aged matron replied, Me? I get enough aggra aggravation from the living without messing with the dead. As for a final word on the subject, Mrs. Dowdell said, Keep off my property. You know who you are. The next ghost you see could be you. After the news broke, the rumor of spooky doings in the melon patch spread far out into the county. A steady line of cars and trucks edged along our street every evening, bumper to bumper. People craned their necks for a glimpse of anything they could see. Flash bulbs popped from back seats. Mrs. Dowdell's cob house blocked most of the view, but people could see the glow of her campfire like an eerie halo above. You children... Mother said in a weary voice, Keep completely out of this. Where's Ruth Ann? In a day or two, the police chief and the newspaper were swamped with reports of strange lights in the night and sudden sounds. We Barnharts were used to sudden sounds by now. It was the hunting season, at least in Mrs. Dowdell's mind. Pintails, mallards, teals, the first of the migrating Canada geese, often flapped their last over her property. 
any time before dark, you were apt to hear the full voice of a 12-gauge shotgun. Then, something on the wing would stop short in the sky and drop like a rock. And whether it was actually pheasant season or not, it was too late to warn the pheasant. Another week or so, and rumors of the ghost princess began to blend with last year's big news. People remembered how the Russians had sent their two Sputnik rockets into orbit, one with a dog riding in it. And that dog was named Laika, or Barker. You can look her up. This brought back the topic of flying saucers. Mrs. L.J. Weidenbach, the banker's wife, granted an interview with the Piat County Call. She spoke for the membership of the Daughters of the American Revolution, saying, The Russians are perfectly capable of disguising one of their spies as the ghost of an Indian princess, or anything else of either sex, not to mention a flying dog. The enemy is already among us. We're probably radioactive already. We must keep our eyes peeled and support our troops. Over on the high school side, the kids were abuzz. They'd all trespassed on the haunted melon patch at one time or another, but nobody could finger the couples who'd left the Thunderbird wine and picnic back blankets and transistor radios behind when the Kickapoo Princess scared them off. A few began to remember they'd seen something they couldn't put a name to in the melon patch. They milled in the school halls and couldn't settle. Test scores dropped. A Boy Scout troop working toward Eagle said there ought to be a badge for ghost spotting. The whole matter might have died down with football season and corn husking and high school homecoming on the way, but things took another turn on a certain moonless night. And it wasn't Boy Scouts. It was girls. A bunch of them. I slept through most of it, up till the screaming and gunfire, but by daybreak, the whole town had all the particulars. <clears throat> Though high school sororities weren't allowed, there was one run by a redhead named Waynetta Blaylock. Her mother had been a lovejoy, and they owned uh, the hybrid seed corn and the grain elevator. The sorority was Iota Nu Beta, which some people said stood for I Oughta Know Better. This was the time of the year Iota Nu Beta initiated new freshman girls, not Phyllis. She said herself she wasn't eligible since she couldn't wear makeup and only had two skirts. Waynetta had said all over school that Phyllis was poor as a church mouse and anyhow, not from here. Even down in the grades, we heard all about the plans for a secret Iota New Beta or Iota New Beta initiation. Waynetta personally leaked word that it would take place in the vicinity of the haunted melon patch. On that moonless Friday night, according to eyewitnesses, the, the Iota New Beta girls met out behind our house by our car. We had a car, we just didn't have gas money for it. And it burned a quart of oil if you hit the starter. It was a 1950 Nash four-door. We called it the pickle because of its shape. Also, it was green. From over by the parked pickle, the sorority girls could see across the cannas. There, Mrs. Dowdell slumped asleep before her dying fire. Out there on the flat ground, she must have looked like the Rock of Gibraltar. Her shotgun lay broken open and was beginning to slip off her knees. The scene was silent as the grave except for a little ground wind rattling the gourd vine against the cob house. The first girl to be initiated, first and last, was Barbara Jean Jeter. She wore baby doll shorty pajamas and spooly plastic curlers. She had to crawl out in the patch, steal a squash within range of Mrs. Dowdell, and then crawl back. The other part of the initiation to eat a large sandwich and recite a dirty limerick was slated for later at Waynetta's house. Edna Earl Stubbs and Vinette Pankey, the sorority sergeants at arms, gave Barbara Jean a kick to start her out. Even if she didn't believe in ghosts, she had to believe in Mrs. Dowdell's shotgun. So she belly crawled low 
and it would have been pretty dank down in that sandy soil for a girl dressed in as little as Barbara Jean was, but freshmen will do anything to belong. Barbara Jean crept on from melon to melon, from squash to squash. At this point, eyewitness reports differ. Vanette Panky said that even from the pickle, she heard a sound, a rattle of dried beans in a gourd. Ed and Earl Stubbs said no. The first sound was a distant drum beat, very far off. Boom, 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 like that. Anyway, it didn't wake Mrs. Dowdell. Then we come to some real confusion. Firelight played against the cob house wall. The gourd vine cast fluttering shadows. Winetta herself said she was the first to see somebody or something standing there, the vines grown up around her. Some creature of the night or history. Not quite life-size, but definitely there. Another sorority girl said no. The first sighting of the ghost was right up by Mrs. Dowdell, like it had just stepped out from behind her, or floated, with firelight on its face. Wrong, Edna Earl said. She clearly saw the Kickapoo princess descending from a great height, probably heaven or the happy hunting ground. Edna Earl saw a pair of beaded moccasins dangling a good six feet above the ground, maybe higher. They were all scared, too speechless to warn Barbara Jean, but they all agreed on one point. The Kickapoo princess was wearing a full feathered headdress and carried a pair of gourd rattles in her weirdly pale little hands, and they all said her hair was in braids. Anyway, here came Barbara Jean through the melons, working along on her elbows. She was in, within reach of the dying fire and spotting for squash when she heard something or saw something. She jumped up before she thought, stumbled, and fell back, then sat down hard. Everybody over by the pickle heard a snapping sound. Barbara Jean sent a scream that tore the night in two. Help! she shrieked. I've been grabbed. The ghost's dragging me into her grown grave. Save me! Barbara Jean was heard uptown. She certainly brought Mrs. Dowdell around. She vaulted out of deep sleep, and her pails went over behind her. She fished two shells out of her apron and fed them into the shotgun. Shouldering the butt of the gun into her afghans, she swung wildly. Hold your fire, Barbara Jean screamed. I'm already half buried, and the ghost is biting me right on my... Kaboom! Kaboom! Mrs. Dowdell fired twice. A tongue of red flame from each barrel licked the night. People all over the township called the chief of police. Barbara Jean's screams knocked me out of bed. Then the gunplay. When I came out of my room, the door to Phyllis and Ruth Ann's was closed. How could they sleep through this? I wondered. Downstairs, Mother and Dad were on the back porch, wearing blankets. The pickle stood alone. Seeing a sorority sister in dire danger, the Iota New Betas had all hightailed at home to save their own skins. As president, Waynetta Blaylock was no doubt in the lead. Mrs. Dowdell had already released Barbara Jean from the steel jars of a spring-action rabbit trap, which had a good firm hold on her where it hurts most. Now the red light on the police chief's dodge lit up everything. There was enough light to explain any unexplained presence. Mrs. Dowdell stood with one hand on her hip and the shotgun in the crook of her other arm. She'd raised one flap on her cap to hear what Police Chief C.P. Snopes had to say. He was as well-armed as she was, but she could outdraw him. Doggone it, Mrs. Dowdell. Discharging a firearm within the city limits is a crime. So's trespassing. Mrs. Dowdell nodded down at Barbara Jean, still sprawled along among the melons. Anyhow, who says we're inside the city limits? A crowd was gathering out at the edge of the light. People from all around the neighborhood in the darndest array of sleepwear you ever saw. The county surveyor says so, C.P. Snoke said. 
You know yourself the city limits is that woven wire fence that runs along the west side of your property. Do tell. Mrs. Dowdell poked at her fire with a big shoe. You talking white man's law? I'd say this ancient Kickapoo burial ground was here long before the first so-called pioneers. C.P. Snoke scratched up under his cap. Mrs. Dowdell, are you telling me you live on an Indian reservation? I reserve the right to protect my property is what I'm telling you. Run that gal in, Mrs. Dowdell said. Read her rights and book her like they do on the television. C.P. Snoke's flashlight revealed a no-nonsense, heavy-duty, patented rabbit trap nearby Barbara Jane. Oh, that's a mean-looking rabbit trap, C.P. Snoke said. But legal, Mrs. Dowdell said. Catch many rabbits? Caught one tonight, she said. Looks like a snowshoe hare. Sure enough, in the flashlight's beam, Barbara Jane looked a lot like a scared white rabbit in plastic hair curlers and shorty pajamas. Her eyes were pink in the glare. Her nose twitched, though she was still too scared to cry. C.P. Snokes got a good look at her. Doggone it, I, I can't run her in. How come, Mrs. Dowdell said. She's the Jeter girl, the doctor's daughter, and her mama was a... I know what her mama was, Mrs. Dowdell said. Tell her to keep her gal home at night. My motto is, ready, fire, aim. Keep that in mind. Next time, there won't be a, enough left of her to initiate. And that pretty well rounded out the night. C.P. Snokes put Barbara Jean in his dodge. Now she was crying buckets, though he was only taking her home to the Jeters out on the Lap Place Road. The seat of her shorty pajamas hung in tatters. Barbara Jean was crying her eyes out, but she had a good grip on a medium-sized acorn squash. Mrs. Dowdell kicked ashes on her embers and went on up to the house, the Winchester over her arm. In these last hours before dawn, the town tried to settle. I couldn't, and was still wide awake to hear a stealthy foot on the stairs. I peered out of my room just as Phyllis's form vanished into hers. I followed. She nearly jumped over the bed when I turned up there on her heels. Still, she had the sense not to scream. The envelope to a letter she was writing to Elvis Presley was on her table. Private Elvis Presley, A Company, 1st Medium Tank Battalion, 32nd Regiment, Fort Hood, Texas. She moved between me and it. But I had reason to know she signed all her letters to Elvis. Love me tender, Phyllis. Ruth Ann slept with a nightlight. The Elvises loomed over her. The Elvises over Phyllis's bed glowed in the dark. It was from the, excuse me, the Elvis over Phyllis's bed glowed in the dark. It was from the Jailhouse Rock movie. Close that door, Phyllis whispered at me. What are you doing up at this? The whole town's up, I whispered back. Big doings in the melon patch. Haunts, gunfire, sorority girls, the law. You can't hear yourself think. We thought you went to bed early. I did, Phyllis said, somewhat shifty. Then I got up and went on a hayride. I thought the future farmer's hayride was next weekend. It is, Phyllis whispered, not looking me in the eye. There were little bits of straw and hay all over her, from her barrettes to her penny loafers. Her rolled-up jeans were dusty with chaff. M Mother and Dad didn't know you sneaked out, I accused. I didn't sneak out, she said. I left quietly. I'm 14. I have a life to live in many important ways. I'm practically 20. Oh, I said. And clear out of my room, Phyllis whispered. It loomed pink around us. Ruth Ann will wake up, and it'll be your fault. We glanced around the pink stripe to Ruth Ann's side. 
She was this little mound in the bed, snoring lightly, with one small hand on top of the covers, a drying hollyhock doll nestled by her chin. For Pete's sake, Phyllis murmured, what are those feathers doing all around her bed? It looks like a pheasant flew in here and blew up. What are all those feathers doing around Ruth Ann's bed? Inquiring minds want to know. What do you think? What do you think happened in the haunted melon patch? Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your friends. See if you can figure it out. Maybe we'll find out more tomorrow. Maybe not. But let's tune back in and see.